Good afternoon. And welcome to the Center for Catholic and Dominican Studies. My name is Father Joseph Guido. I'm Vice President for Mission and Ministry here at Providence College. By way of preliminaries, I want to say just three things. First, in a few moments, we're about to hear from several remarkable young people, in some ways, the best at Providence College. They've braved a rather difficult and, in some ways, arduous application process in order to obtain a Father Smith Fellowship. But more than that, they've given us an example of a kind of intrepid daring by going far and abroad in service of Christ and in the company of St. Dominic. But their experience wasn't simply to enrich their own understanding of the faith and of other people, but ours as well. And this is the third, I believe, in the round of talks and discussions about their experience they've had this week. And there may be more to come. So they're enriching the Providence College community even as they themselves were enriched by their experience. The second thing I want to say is that none of this would have been possible without the generosity of a number of donors, most of them alumni and alumnae of Providence College. The program is completely funded by donor support and receives no support directly from the college. And so these young people and all of us here at the college are deeply indebted to the generosity of those who've given with such trust to our young people. But despite the intrepid nature of our young people and the generosity of our donors, in truth, none of this would be possible without the hard work and dedication of Father Kevin Robb, who's the Associate Vice President for Mission and Ministry, and more importantly in this context, the Chair of the Selection Committee for the Father Smith Fellowship. He's both the brains and the brawn and the dedication behind the program. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce him. Thank you, Father Guido. I have to say publicly that never in my wildest imagination would I have ever seen myself uh, being the director of an overseas fellowship program. And it's been a very interesting three years. Our first two fellows went off in the summer of 2009. One went to the Philippines a couple hours outside of Manila, and uh, she worked in an orphanage. The other was the first to go to the halls of Oxford, and she's with us. And I'd ask Elizabeth Weber to stand. Yay, Elizabeth. Elizabeth is in her second year of a master's degree program in philosophy at the Catholic University of America and has just become engaged to one of her classmates here at Providence College. The wedding is next July. The summer of 2010, we had five fellows go off. One again to Oxford, uh, one to uh, Managua, Nicaragua, Two went off to Kasumu, Kenya for the first time, and uh, a fifth went to um, Sydney, Australia, working with the Dominican sisters there. And she is Leah Santilli, and she's here. Uh, so let's give Leah a bit of acknowledgement. This past summer, we were blessed to have eight Smith Fellows head off to various points uh, around the world. We had two who headed to Oxford. You will hear from one of them momentarily. He's Michael Wall. The other one is Nathan Ricci, who presented on Tuesday evening. And Nathan just walked in. You want to stand up, Nathan? We had a young man go off to Adelaide in South Australia to work with the Dominican Friars in their Black Friars Priory School uh, just outside Adelaide. And that was T.J. Mills, and T.J. is here. Where are you, T.J.?
Annie Wendell, whom you'll hear from at the very end of this program, um, did the Australia thing, as Leah did last year for three weeks, and then she went off to the Solomon Islands, to a place called Alki on Malaita Island in the Solomon Islands, whose bishop is a member of our Dominican province, Bishop Chris Cardone of the PC class of 1980. He went off uh, and to the uh, Solomons right after ordination and has never come home. And then they eventually gave him a pointy hat and a crooked stick. And now he goes from island to island ministering to his flock. And Annie spent some time uh, in uh, Alki. And now I have several more for next summer clamoring to get there. We sent four off to Kasumu in Kenya this year. Uh, the, the two who went last year did such a job advertising when they came back that most of our applications last uh, January were, were for Kasumu, Kenya. We could have sent nine. They could only receive four. Uh, so four of them went off. And you will hear from three of the four today. You'll hear from uh, Tommy Cody. You'll hear from Katie McCann and Katie Tripp. And you will hear, uh, no, you won't hear from Kevin Brawley, but he's here. Kevin, stand up. Kevin Brawley. Uh, they each have put together the 12 minute the presentation. Um, the Kasumu folks have 24 minutes all told. Uh, we will try to get you out in time for mass. But they tell wonderful stories of their experiences. And each one tells it a little differently. But you will get a taste of what they experienced, whether it was in Oxford, whether it was in Kasumu, Kenya, or whether it was in Sydney, Australia, or Alki in the Solomons. These are our Smith Fellows for 2011. On Tuesday, we will have the information session for the Smith Fellowships for 2012. So even as 2011 ends today, 2012 begins on Tuesday. I echo what Father Guido said. We can only do this because of the generosity of a good number of people who've heard about the Smith Fellowships and um, have said, I want to support one, or I want to support more than one. Um, I was hoping that three of the principal donors would be here today, um, but I don't think that they've arrived yet. But I will acknowledge Elizabeth Weber's family. Uh, most of them are here with Elizabeth today, and they too have been generous to the Smith Fellowship Program over the three years. So I thank John and Peggy Weber, and Matthew and Elizabeth, and their absent sister Carrie. So thank you. Anyway. Without further ado, I invite Michael Wall to come up and tell us about his Oxford movements. Come on, Michael. <clears throat> I will be leaving in the middle of the presentation to go over and uh, prepare the chapel for Mass. Uh, so I will bid you adieu now, and Father Guido will uh, keep things moving and uh, close the session at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Father Rob and Father Guido. Um, and a word of thanks also to the donors uh, without whom this wouldn't be possible. My name is Michael Wall. I'm a senior, double majoring in math and theology uh, here at Providence College. And this summer, I was blessed with the opportunity to spend six weeks in Oxford through the generosity of the Father Philip Smith Fellowship for service and study abroad. My fellowship was centered on a study of the life and work of blessed John Henry Cardinal Newman, the 18th century Oxford scholar and Anglican curate turned Roman Catholic cardinal, who was just beatified by our Holy Father last September. The idea for this project began two summers ago when I attended a conference on liberal arts education. One of the texts we discussed over the course of the week was Newman's famous work, The Idea of a University, in which he outlines his idea for what, an, what a university is what the goals of education are, and how religion ought to be integrated into the academy. I found him to be an extraordinary, extraordinarily compelling writer with a beautiful style and a sense of wonder and reverence for education. 
At the week's end, I had a great desire to read more of Newman and to delve more deeply into his thought. Thus, when considering a project proposal for this fellowship, Cardinal Newman qu came quickly to mind. And there's certainly no better place to study Newman than Oxford, the home of a large and prestigious university and the place where Newman spent most of his own life. My time at Oxford was spent primarily under the auspices of Blackfriars Hall, which is a permanent private hall of the University of Oxford, and it's run by the Dominican Friars of the English province. Um, we've sent fellows there, as Father Rob said, for the last three years, uh, so there's quite a strong Dominican connection between Providence and Blackfriars. Blackfriars is set up, um, it sort of, it's got a dual setup. It serves as the studium, which is the house of formation for the Dominican Friars and other religious uh, who are studying for the priesthood or other forms of ministry in the church. And it's also a hall of the university. So there are students there from all over the world, uh, undergraduates and postgraduate students, who are studying theology, philosophy, literature, economics, politics. So it's really quite an eclectic community. Um, we were able to live uh, in common. There were several houses. I lived with uh, four graduate students from all over the world. We had um, a gentleman from the Philippines, a Dominican sister from Iraq. Um, so it was really an international community where we lived. Um, we you know, prayed with the friars, went to mass at uh, the Black Friars Chapel, which you see here. And it was a really uh, extraordinary way um, to spend my summer. While I was at Oxford, I undertook a series of tutorials with Father Guy Nichols, who is a member of the Congregation of the Oratory, which is the religious order which Cardinal Newman belonged to. Um, and Newman was actually the one who brought the Oratorians to England. Um, Father Nichols is an expert on Newman and education, so it was really a privilege for me to be able to study with him. Um, I spent a good deal of time at lectures in Oxford. Um, I undertook a series of lectures um, under a Dominican friar on Mariology, um, which didn't really have much to do with Newman, although he did love Our Lady. Um, but it was just pretty fun. Um, Oxford had a number of really distinguished speakers who came to, who came to speak at the university. Uh, here you see Peter Cardinal Turkson, who is the president for the Pontifical Council on Peace and Justice in Rome. Uh, and he came and gave the annual John Henry Newman Lecture at Oxford, in which he discussed the relationship between faith and politics. Um, and as you see, we had a chance to, to speak with his eminence uh, afterwards. And there were many, uh, many speakers of this caliber who were in Oxford uh, day in and day out. So really got a chance to meet a lot of great thinkers and to be able to hear them speak and talk with them afterwards. I also spent a great deal of time at this desk in the library, um, reading and writing and studying. Um, I was able to work on two, two long papers while I was there. One is on um, Newman's understanding of education having both an intellectual and a moral dimension and another paper which is still sort of a work in progress on um, comparing Newman and St. Thomas Aquinas on education and teaching. But aside from the academics, there was really a great community at Blackfriars. Um, as you see, this is our picture taken at the end of the term. While we were in Oxford, uh, Nathan and I, for our six weeks, the, um, the academic term at Blackfriars and the whole university actually was still in full swing. There were students there from the day we got there until the day we left, which was a fantastic opportunity and gave us a chance to really get to know um, the people that we were living with and studying with. In fact, Newman himself said that when a multitude of young people, keen, open-hearted, sympathetic, and observant, as young people often are, come together and mix with each other, they are sure to learn from one another, even if there is no one to teach them. The conversation of all is a series of lectures to each, and they gain for themselves new ideas and views fresh matter of thought, and distinct principles for judging and acting day by day. And this was really my experience, and I'm sure it was Nathan's as well, of being able to live and converse with people from all over the world, studying different things um, brought together into this community. Um, you see here our garden party at the end of the term, which the friars uh, put on for all the students and faculty, and our ball at the end of the year. Um, it was the first annual Blackfriars Ball, so it was something special to be a part of that. It was really a fitting way to end our time studying and living together. And here you see our PC contingent. Um, there are two PC students who were studying abroad in Oxford for the year who were also at Blackfriars when Nathan and I were there. And um, Tom Riley, who's standing right next to me, is a 2010 grad who's um, 
pursuing a degree at Oxford right now. So there was a, a well-represented uh, Providence delegation there. Oxford is a city with a lot of history and a lot of tradition. And Newman says that it's scarcely too much to say that one half the education a young person receives is derived from the tradition of the place where he is educated. And I found that to be very, very true. Um, I would often go to the library in the morning and get my reading and, and writing done for the day and spend the afternoon sort of wandering around the city, uh, finding a new museum or a new college to visit. Um, and there were just so many sites to take in, Maudlin College here and um, the library, the Bodleian, and Christchurch College. There is a real sense of tradition at Oxford with um, great thinkers, great statesmen, great religious figures who have all worked and studied and taught there. Um, and it was wonderful to really be a part of that. There was also a, a lighter side uh, to my time there. Um, I spent a few Sunday afternoons on the Thames River punting. It's not as easy as it looks. You stick the pole into the mud at the, at the bottom of the, of the river, and the boat's supposed to go straight forward. But if you'll ask Nathan, we spent more time bouncing from side to side than going up and downstream. Um, there is also a real religious importance um, to my time there. Newman was more than just an intellectual figure. He was a pastor, um, and he really considered everything that he did, his teaching and his pastoral work, as the same vocation. And that integration of, of the religious aspect and the intellectual aspect of my fellowship was an important one for me. Newman writes that he wishes for the same spots and for the same individuals to be at once oracles of philosophy and shrines of devotion. He says that devotion is not a finish giving to the sciences, nor is science an ornament for devotion. He wants the intellectual to be religious and the ecclesiastic to be intellectual. And I was able to um, get myself really involved um, in the religious life of Oxford as well. The Oxford Oratory was the parish church in Oxford, um, which is serviced by the Oratorian Fathers, which Newman brought to England. Um, it's a beautiful parish, um, and I tried to get to Mass there on Sundays when I went to Blackfriars during the week. And it was a wonderful community to become a part of. We got to know a lot of the local, local Catholics in Oxford um, and to meet their families and get to know what they do and how they spend their time. Um, we, spent, we ate money a potluck dinner in the parish hall, which is a great deal when you're cooking for yourself. You just provide brownies and you get the full meal. Um, the last weekend before we left, Oxford hosted, held its annual Corpus Christi procession through the streets, and I was honored to be asked to carry one of the banners at the start of the procession, um, which I thought was a fitting way to end my relationship with the, the oratory, um, which was a great home for me while I was there as well. While I was in Oxford, there was also sort of a, a Newman pilgrimage of sorts which I undertook. Uh, Newman studied at Trinity College in Oxford and was a tutor and a fellow at Oriel College uh, right down the street from there and also served as the curate of the university church. So during his 30 some odd years in Oxford, um, Newman was sort of all over the place. This is the chapel uh, where Newman was received into the church where he had his conversion and had his first confession heard. Um, and this is at Littlemore, which is right outside, right outside Oxford. Um, and I was privileged to spend a bit of time there looking through their archives and speaking with the people who work there. We got invited to their annual garden party, which was, which was quite a hit. And I also was able to spend a few evenings with a group of local people uh, who meet once a month to read Newman's poetry and his other writings and discuss them. So it was really great to also sort of get the common perspective on Newman and how he's appreciated in that local area. I was also a part of the Newman Society in Oxford, which is a, a, a fellowship group for students at the university, which stretches way back into the mid 19th century. Actually, uh, the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins was one of its founding members. And they would meet once a week with a speaker um, from somewhere in the university. And it was just another great way to get involved in that, that local Oxford community and to really immerse myself in the Oxford culture. They had their annual banquet at the end of the year, and I was invited to join them for that. There are a lot of black tie dinners in Oxford. I also um, befriended a graduate student at Oriel, um, which is where Newman was a fellow. And so I was able to get the sort of behind the scenes tour of the college. Um, I saw the chapel where he preached when he was chaplain there. I saw um, the rooms where he lived while he was chaplain there. 
and uh, this is the dining hall. There's a picture of Newman right along the window, and this is actually where he took all of his exams when he was a student as well. I did a bit of traveling as well. Uh, went to see all the sites in London. You can't go to England and not be a tourist. Um, I can't help it. I was also able to go to Salisbury, England, um, for a conference on Cardinal Newman, which was run by an ecumenical college. So I was able to hear how Newman's perceived both in Anglican circles and in Catholic circles, which was um, a very eye-opening experience and provided a lot of fruitful dialogue. I was also able to see the splendid cathedral uh, that they have in Salisbury. It's 12th century Gothic, and it's, it's fantastic. I spent an entire afternoon wandering around. I was also able to take a, a, a brief visit to Freiburg in Switzerland to meet with the Dominican friars there. And we spent one day um, in Evian in France, which is just over the border on the other side of Lake Geneva. And we visited a number of sites that are associated with St. Francis de Sales, uh, who was Newman's, um, one of Newman's favorite saints. Newman had a great devotion to him. His Episcopal motto, Cora Cor Loquitur, was taken from St. Francis's writings, and you'll see a picture of Newman's chapel later. There's a big picture of St. Francis hanging right over the altar. So it was a privilege to see some of these sites. Uh, this is where St. Francis celebrated daily mass when he was in hiding during part of the Reformation. Uh, also, when you can't go to Switzerland and not go to the Alps, so I did spend an afternoon hiking uh, in the Alps with Father Dominic Legg, who was a professor here during my first two years. Um, and the pictures don't do it justice. There are some incredible views. And Switzerland can't be Switzerland without fondue. So I enjoyed fondue uh, with local cheese um, with the friars in Freiburg. The most impressive trip that I was able to make while I was abroad was to Birmingham, which is where Newman spent the last 40 years of his life. After he converted uh, to the church and was ordained an oratorian priest, he founded the first oratory in England in Birmingham. And it's a splendid Baroque church um, from the end of the, the 19th century. And I stayed there for three days um, with Father Nichols, who is my tutor. He's stationed at the Birmingham Oratory. And went to Mass there and prayed and was able to go through their archives a bit. Um, because I was with Father Nichols, I was able to get uh, some behind the scenes access. This is the new shrine that they have to Newman, which was just dedicated uh, when the Holy Father was in Birmingham last September. They have a lot of Newman's relics and um, his own belongings that are stored behind the, uh, behind the shrine. I was able to see some of those. I was able to go through their library. Um, most of those books are, belong to Cardinal Newman. He was a very well-read man. Um, I spent a morning in there, and it was quite a privilege to leaf through books that are you know, 300 years old and see Newman's handwriting in the margins. Um, that was something that was really incredible. I was also able to see uh, the Cardinal's room in Birmingham, which very, very few people uh, get to see. I was signing the guest book, and it's only about four pages long. And when you look through the names, you see the Holy Father's name, you see uh, bishops and scholars. It was really a privilege. They've preserved it immaculately. Um, the same newspaper clippings that Cardinal Newman had on, taped on his wall the day he died are still hanging there, um, or what's left of them anyway. Um, it was really, really an incredible opportunity. Um, and this is just another shot of his room. And there's that chapel where he celebrated mass as a cardinal and the picture of St. Francis, who was such an inspiration to him. My studies at Oxford were an eye-opening and incredible experience, to say the least. And it's something that I certainly won't forget. I was able to really immerse myself in the culture of the city, getting to know the people, um, getting to speak with the professors and the faculty there, um, you know, in the church, um, the church there, and even getting just to explore the city and to meet people on the streets. And, you know, Oxford is one of the cities uh, where everyone has a story to tell. And uh, when you talk to people, you, you learn quite a bit. Um, with regard to Newman in particular, the opportunity to study about him in Oxford was something that uh, it was an invaluable experience. Um, in the shadow of the University of Oxford, to study about the university, I had a real first-hand experience of what education was like for Newman, what he saw that was good about it, what he saw that he needed to change and he wanted to change, um, and to see also just how he's remembered um, in Oxford. 
you saw the, the statue of him that's standing, uh, that was standing in the gardens at Trinity, which is on the first slide. Uh, there are little mementos and tokens of his memory that are scattered throughout the city. So it was sort of fun to have a little scavenger hunt to find those. My experience is studying in Oxford, the friends and the acquaintances I made there, and my research on the relationship between the church and the university and the nature of the university itself haven't remained in Oxford, though. For while they thoroughly inform my understanding of my own experience, <clears throat> my own experiences in Oxford, they've also formed my own experience of education at Providence College. Its mission is a liberal arts college and an institution with deep and, and lively Dominican and Catholic roots. I hope that my own experiences and insights from studying in Oxford will be helpful for our community here as we strive to fulfill the charge of the university, which according to Newman, is to be an alma mater who inspires affection in her students while she gently whispers truth to them. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Katie Tripp. I am a senior at PC. I'm Katie McCann. I am also a senior. I'm a public service and political science double major. I am Tommy Cody. I am an English major and I am a junior at Providence College. I'm a finance major. <laughs> um, <laughs> so our mission um, and through our travel to Kisumu, Kenya was one of service. Um, it was an incredible experience, so this is us trying to put that into words. Um, this was the timeline um, of our time in Kenya. We had a very full seven weeks, beginning with a four-day hike of Mount Kenya, um, five weeks at the Our Lady of Grace School in Kisumu, Kenya, um, and in conclusion, it was, uh, we had a safari in the Masai Mara for four days. Um, it was a wonderful taste of the country. So, uh, as I said, our journey began um, climbing Mount Kenya, which was a wonderful way to start our trip. Um, it really tested our strengths physically, emotionally, um, spiritually, and it brought us together as a group, uh, the four of us traveling together. Um, like I said, it was four days. Most people do it in five. We chose four. <laughs> um, and we did make it all the way to the summit. Um, that's us on the top of Mount Kenya, 16,000 feet up. Um, during our journey in Kenya, we, uh, the four of us kept blogs about our experience. Um, tried to blog every day when there was electricity. Um, uh, just to kind of keep track of how we were feeling at the time and the things that we were going through. So I uh, am going to read an excerpt from my blog of Mount Kenya um, because this was my current mindset and it has been some time since. So um, pole pole is a phrase in Kiswahili which means slowly by slowly. This phrase became our mantra for the journey. About halfway up, I felt that I could go, couldn't go any further. My breaths were short and I was physically exhausted. I asked Richard, our guide, if he thought I could go on or if he thought it was best for me to go back down the mountain. He said that I needed more water and to do what I thought because only I knew how I was feeling. He also said he believed I could do it, pole pole. Richard believed in me when I stopped believing in myself. I was praying and repeating the words of the little engine that could. I think I can, I think I can. But even that did not seem to be enough. I needed the encouragement of someone else. I needed someone else to believe in me when I did not have the confidence in myself. 
Richard took my hand and walked me to the summit, pole pole. We made our own pace as the rest of the group went on with another guide. Richard held my hand the rest of the way as we both climbed to the summit. We reached the summit at sunrise and saw the day begin in Kenya from its highest point. I was so proud of myself and even more grateful to Richard for all of his guidance. The climb was a test of my faith, trust, and ability to surrender. I had to surrender over to God and to let him and Richard guide me to the top. I was so overcome with emotion and gratitude that I wept on the summit. It was one of the most beautiful sights I had ever seen and one of the hardest I've ever worked for. When I climbed back down and reflected upon what I had done, I was stunned to think that this journey had yet to begin. It would now be my turn for the next five weeks to take the, the, to take the hands of the children at Our Lady of Grace like Richard did for me. I hope to remind them that they can do it, that they should believe in themselves, and that if they dream it, it is achievable. So that just kind of sums up how I was feeling at the time. Like I mentioned, I think I speak for all four of us. It was much more than we were anticipating um, in the climb, and it really did um, make our entrance into the country very memorable. Uh, we were able to see the beauty that is the people of Kenya um, in our guides and uh, also in its nature. Um, so it was a wonderful way to begin our trip. Um, this was just some photos of our, of our journey up the mountain. That's the summit that we uh, hiked to. I also didn't expect there to be snow in Africa. Um, that was something that I was surprised by, as well as the greenery um, on our hike. These were the men that led us to the top of Mount Kenya. Um, I think I can speak for all of us when I say that this experience was a lesson in faith and in trust. Um, so many times we just had to let go because we couldn't control everything around us, which was difficult. Um, we met these men uh, of about 15 minutes before we <laughs> got in the car with them to head to the base of the mountain. We actually, I, I, I didn't think that they were our porters. We, we didn't really speak the same language. Um, they did speak little English. We spoke no Swahili at that point. Um, and so our communication was minimal, but they are the reasons why we made it to the summit and um, were able to cross that off of a bucket list. Um, and we will never see them again, but they were with us for that time. Um, that was also another theme on our trip of these wonderful people um, taking care of us that we didn't even know. This was us at the end of the trip, um, having not showered for five days, <laughs> uh, getting ready to head to Kisumu. Now, each of us had different proposals for our time in Kisumu. Um, mine was focused on development work given my background in public service and political science. I had a few different organizations that I wanted to connect to uh, the students at Our Lady of Grace to support their sponsorships and to work on the development. So just a quick overview of the school is that it was founded by the Dominican Friars in 2008 following the post-election violence in Kenya. Um, a lot of that violence was concentrated in the Kisumu area where the school started, initially under the mango trees on um, some stumps of trees as the classrooms. The school expanded and so they needed to find ways to sponsor these students, to pay for their education and to expand the school. So the friars turned to outside administrators to run the school but continued to fundraise for the sponsorships of the students and for different programs at the school. So Father Tom's Kids is the sponsorship organization that funds all of the students at Our Lady of Grace School, but they also fund some students at the university level and at other trade schools.
So while we were there, we created a mission statement to clarify some of the objectives and goals of the organization. And we worked with Father Martin Martini, who is the director of the Father Tom's Kids Sponsorship Organization, to create this nice little concise mission statement while they offer a wide range of services and support to the students. We created this to say to offer an opportunity for young people to discover their natural dignity, talent, and potential by educating them in a disciplined environment that is challenging and nurturing. This is a picture of the entire school body with the Kasumu Fellows and our dear friend, Brother Dominic, who was also there and helped guide our time there and lead a retreat with us. But just a note on the organization, there were times when I know I was frustrated with the lack of organization and I had a very clear idea of how a good nonprofit should be run and how things should work and that is not how they were working in Kenya. Um, Sometimes we didn't have internet, sometimes we didn't have electricity. Those things affect the ability to run a successful organization. Um, but I was also frustrated with the flexibility and how sometimes exceptions were made for students that weren't exactly fair or weren't across the board. Um, but then one day, uh, three students at the school that we became friends with and we were teaching and playing soccer with became true orphans. Their mother, who was terminally ill with cancer and being treated at the hospice center, had died. Their father had died years before. And we were in the, this meeting talking about the development aspects of it, and it became obvious that somebody needed to take care of this woman's funeral. Somebody needed to support these children and sometimes exceptions needed to be made. Um, and again, I'm gonna read just a quick sentence from my blog to express how I was feeling at that time because I think those are emotions that I need to stay in touch with while I'm back here. So I reflected, this is why the ministry of Father Tom's Kids is so incredibly important. It attempts to provide parental love, support, and guidance to children who have nowhere else to turn children have, who have no option of foster care or adoption, children who despite these challenges possess determination to keep living and keep loving. So those are a few of my lessons in the development aspects of our time at the school and Tommy will now also talk about the faith aspects. We were in the classroom teaching, which more often than not the students taught us more lessons than we could ever teach them. Here are a few of class four I spent a lot of time working with. Oh, those are drum lessons, so I learned how to play the drum while I was there. This is Brother Dominic, another student in class four, and here is Tommy with his. Thank you very much. Just one second. I'm going to turn the. Probably going to end up doing hand motions, so I know if I have a microphone in my hand, it's going to be going everywhere, and you won't be able to hear me. Um, I wanted to talk about a lot of the Dominican aspect of the school that we worked at, um, how they help the students in the Dominican mission abroad. For me, seeing the Dominicans outside of the Providence College campus was really kind of a shock. Um, Providence College was my first interaction with Dominicans. Um, and seeing them in Africa was just kind of something completely outside of my imagination. Um, when I applied, I wanted to experience, I stated that I wanted to experience the Catholic, and, um, the Catholic Church outside of the Western world. Um, and especially the Dominicans, what they did, exactly what the are the Dominicans doing in Kisumu, Kenya. Now, I know what they're doing at um, Providence College, they're teaching, but what could they possibly have to do? I think Katie and Kate have given a small idea of what exactly they were doing and how much they've helped these students here. Um, you know, in a, in a way, I feel the only way to communicate this is by a story. I want to be telling you a couple of quick stories. Uh, after I give you a general outline of what the Dominicans did and what we, how we interacted with them. Um, we lived with the Dominicans on the Dominican compound. Um, the Dominican compound are actually just behind those walls. Um, those were some of the students that I got to know extremely well over my time there. All of them, their lives were affected by the Dominicans and improved by the Dominicans. Um, not just materially or intellectually, um, but most importantly, um, in their dignity. 
their dignity and their faith um, as children of God, knowing that they had worth, um, which is something that not a lot of these students knew. Um, not a lot of these students were exposed to, not a lot of these students told. Um, were told that by parents, by other teachers um, throughout. Um, every Friday we had dinner with the Dominicans. Um, I know we have a, we have a uh, thing on campus here called Dinner with the Dominicans, but um, this is a little bit different. We ate at the Priory with them, um, which was an incredible experience, um, interacting with the African Dominicans and with our main contact. Um, we'll probably see a picture of him soon, um, Father Chris Saliga, um, fondly known to us as Father Mad Dog. Um, <laughs> Father Chris is an ex-military man and was very, very organized and put us to work right off the bat. We were waking up at 5.30 in the morning, um, every morning going to 610 Rosary. Um, we went to bed at the final. We came back to the compound at 6 o'clock in the afternoon, so we had a full day. Um, Father Chris kept us on task. He was there to guide us the entire way through, help us with our problems, anything that we had questions with. Um, he was an extremely great asset, an extremely great opportunity to know the children, the students, and to spend the best time we could there. Um, Brother Dominic Bump, who I think Katie already mentioned, um, was a student, is a student brother. Um, he was set to become a deacon sometime in the next year or so. Um, and he is a phenomenal, phenomenal man. Um, he helped us so much, again, guiding us spiritually with all the problems, all the problems with evil and the things that we were seeing, how this, we can possibly work through this, um, guiding us along the way. Um, we too, and Mike mentioned the Feast of Corpus Christi, we too had a procession of the Feast of Corpus Christi. It's slightly different, no banners. Um, I think the incense was in a tin cup. Um, and we walked through farmland and through a couple of shanty towns, but um, it was very long, but it was incredible. And, you know, something for me uh, was feeling that connection with my brothers and sisters in Christ in Kenya, um, being told that the Eucharist binds us all, um, but thinking, how could I possibly be brothers and sisters, be bound to, this pe to these students in Africa? Um, and, you know, sitting at Mass, at 1030 Mass in St. Dominic's Chapel, my first night back here, um, I kind of realized that the seven-hour time difference meant that my mass was lining up almost perfectly with the, mass, the morning mass that I used to go to in Kenya. I'm um, feeling that connection, seeing the Dominican priest walk up. I mean, it wasn't to a makeshift altar in an auditorium, but this time it was in a beautiful chapel. Um, but that same essence carried through. Uh, we also went to a university um, that had a Dominican chaplaincy, Maseno University, um, which was where we had the procession, which was incredible to watch the different um, and see the different ways that they um, out, reached out to the greater campus it was a secular university, um, but the Dominicans' presence there is strong. Um, now for these stories that I told you I was going to tell. Um, I got to know most of the upper school boys the best. They're the high school boys from ages 16 to age 22, some of them. Um, some of them are age 22 and still in high school, not by their own fault, but because of the situations they were in. Um, the situations that they were in are not excuses, but they are explanations of why they're in the state that they are in. Um, one of the boys that I got to know, um, we'll call him John, was from Rwanda originally. Um, at age four, his family fled from Rwanda during the violence and the genocide. He does not remember way too much from it. He remembers not being able to sleep at night, sitting in a hut, um, and seeing fires burning outside and people screaming, and he couldn't sleep. Um, all he remembers was being terrified, and eventually, after a month and a day, uh, a month and a week, I think, um, he walked into Tanzania with his family. He remembers seeing a man lose the heel of his foot during a walk. He lost his father and his mother during the walk. His father shortly after from injuries he sustained. Um, and he was raised by his grandmother, who raised, how many, was it 20? I think 20 children um, in her little hut, lovingly, um, Herself, her herself was a convert to Catholicism from Islam, actually. Um, and she raised all these children in the faith as much and best she could. Um, and John grew up thinking that she was his mother for most of his life um, until the day she died and he found out that he didn't. Um, John was brought to the Dominicans um, after a while to Father Martin Martini, who was the, one of the big drives behind this program. Um, Father Martin took him in and set him up with Father Tom's kids program and sent him to a different school. Originally, Father Tom sent students all over Kenya um, to be taught in different schools to kind of try to break down the tribal barriers that were set up. Um, John was angry at everybody, um, at the world, and he didn't have the right attitude. He hated school. He told me himself, he said, I did not want to do any of this. 
Um, it was the Dominicans through tough love, not always through the <laughs> kind, kind love, but what a lot of these students need and what we all do need is the tough love. They whipped me into shape. Um, he is one of the best students at the school now. He's hoping to get into university through his national exams, which are already happened, I think, or coming up um, in November. Um, he's an extremely brilliant, bright student. He wants to study physical therapy. Um, he said it is the Eucharist, being told to go to Mass every day, um, and praying the rosary every morning that helps him get through, that helps him have that attitude of service of God and kind of giving back what the Dominicans gave him. Um, he stressed me over and over again, without Father Martin, without the Dominicans, I wouldn't be in the same situation I am right now. Um, he was a great friend, phenomenal soccer player, um, who tried his best to teach me um, how to be a goalkeeper. Uh, I'm not sure if that was successful in the end, but um, and one last quick story before we hand it over um, once more, one more time of another, another boy who was my savior in mass because at 6.10 in the morning, I, didn't, I couldn't always stay awake. Um, I sometimes started to doze off, and this boy was about 6'7", because he was from the Sudan. Um, and if I nodded off, Father Chris wouldn't point me out, because I would be hiding behind him. Um, so this boy was not just a good friend, but in a way, my savior. Um, Father Chris would generally call out students from in Mass and tell them he would be saying his homily, or he'd be in the middle of something, he would stop, look, you, sit up and stand in the front of the church. Stop falling asleep during Mass. Um, so luckily I was able to stand behind chair. And there's Father Chris um, with all the students. Uh, he did a great job. Um, so this boy, as I said, was from the Sudan. He grew up in the Sudan for most of his life um, and moved from town to town with his family, um, trying to escape the violence that was going on during those times. He said there were pockets where he would be able to go to school, he would be able to go to church. Um, a lot of the violence, a lot of the persecution was um, based religiously. Um, and he said the first thing that these people would do when they would come into his town um, they would be to take the church over and to turn it into a prison and to torture people there so that people would associate Christianity with torture. Um, and he, would, he said for most of his life, he was, his faith, with, faith was on and off. Not that it wasn't strong, not like what we would say as a cradle Catholic, oh, you know, I went to Mass with my parents and then I stopped after... after
thank you, um, here at PC and all over the world. So just to explain some of these photos that we've been clicking through, um, clearly all of the ones with the students were uh, kids at Our Lady of Grace School um, who we all had wonderful, wonderful interaction with. We taught courses um, that didn't need any kind of certification. So creative arts, life skills, handwriting, PE. Um, and they taught us lessons, as Tommy was saying, um, that were much deeper than anything we could have learned in a classroom. Um, I have a story uh, that I experienced um, with one girl. Um, she was 15 years old. Her name was Agnes Judy. And um, one day, she took me aside. And it was a day that I really needed to hear this. And she, kind of out of the blue, told me how she didn't regret the death of her parents. She also was a true orphan. Um, and her two brothers attended the school as well. She told me she didn't regret the death of her parents because that was an event that helped form her into the person that she is today. She also told me um, that suffering, which I think was something that we all struggled with, kind of understanding how this kind of suffering could happen with a merciful God. She told me that suffering is a gift and that it can only happen to wise people because wise people understand what they have and therefore when they no longer have it, that's what suffering is. She said, fools never recognize what they had, therefore they don't suffer. So that was one of the other lessons that we learned. Um, so at the end, yeah, <laughs> at the end of our time at the school, we had the fortune of going on a uh, safari, which was, as you can see here, four days and three nights. Um, and I'm just gonna click through these pictures. They kind of speak for themselves. The safari really rounded out um, the beauty that we were able to experience in Kenya. And these are some Maasai women. I think something that, um, just kind of in conclusion, that we learned with the Dominicans and this whole experience um, was the important of um, education and our faith. Uh, the Dominicans provide um, the Eucharist through daily mass and rosary every day for the students, and they also provide them with an education. So for children that have had so much stripped from them in their lives, being be that the land that, they, that their family owned or um, their parents and their brothers and sisters, um, the Dominicans give them two immaterial things that will lead to their success in life um, and in death. Through the Eucharist and, the edu and their education, they can achieve anything that they want. Um, and that was, I think, the biggest lesson that I took away from the whole trip, and I, I speak for all of us when I say that. Lots of lions. <laughs> Just again to thank all the donors, Father Rob, Father Guido, everybody for allowing us to go on this trip that really transformed us. I know it's the motto of the school and it might sound a little cheesy, but it's really true. Um, whether we know it or not yet, this will impact us throughout the rest of our lives. Um, we would like to thank you so much for all you had done. Um, quickly, all right, we had an eight hour layover in Istanbul, Turkey. We couldn't really resist to run outside of the airport, get on the metro, get to the Hagia Sophia, and then come back. Um, so we were also actually able to go to Turkey um, <laughs> while we were there. So again, thank you so much um, for all that you've done for us. Thank you. Okay, I promise I'll keep it brief. Um, like Father Rob said before, I was fortunate enough to be able to have what I consider the best of both worlds, where I got to go on a uh, stint in Australia for four weeks and shadow the programs that the Dominican sisters are involved in there. Um, and afterwards, I took 
a three hour plane ride to the island of Honiara. And once I got there, discovered that my plane ride to my following island was canceled due to the fact that the airfield was closed because cows and chickens and pigs were running across it. So <laughs> being flexible and patient as one of the um, lessons that I learned on this trip, I boarded a boat, um, not speaking pigeon, which is the primary language that they speak in the Solomon Islands. And getting thrown onto this boat, getting a little bit seasick on the way, I arrived in Alki, which is um, a very, very small town in, um, on the island of Malaita. Um, one thing that I, what happened when I arrived there was the original plan was I was going to help um, teach English and didn't know much about it, um, the, about the program that I was running. It was going to be very flexible um, and I was going to learn more once I arrived in Honiara. Um, Friday morning when I arrived there, I met with Bishop Chris. Um, it was a nice friendly face when I arrived there. Um, and starting Monday morning, I walked into the teacher's lounge of the secondary school across the street and was handed an English grammar textbook and said, this is where we left off on Friday during class. Here's where you can start on Monday morning. And handed me a large stack of books, brought me to a classroom, and left for two weeks. So um, I am no, by no means an education major. And this was a bit of a shock for me. Um, as a public and community service major, I have always been accustomed to having some sort of orientation be before starting a service project. So this was a lesson in flexibility and patience and kind of trusting in my own judgment, um, my own self-confidence, and my own skills that I had. So Monday's lesson consisted of having, um, it was teaching implicit and explicit conclusions. And I kind of felt like that was very uh, thematic for the entire trip because explicitly, I felt like I did not fit in originally. Um, I was very intimidated. Here I was um, alone on this island, wasn't speaking their primary language, but I think implicitly, I was just as much as, um, uh, they were just as intimidated about me as I was of them. Um, I'm only five foot four, I can't quite imagine why, but they did say that they were very intimidated of speaking English to someone who um, was a professional, as they call them, uh, speaking English. So I arrived in the classroom and learned a lot about the culture um, and how it's very quiet. And I think that was also a time of reflection for me. Um, instead of calling out or nodding or even saying, yes, madam, their response to uh, the positive response would be to raise their eyebrows. So a lot of things I had to pick up um, as I went along and just read their facial expressions, read their body language, and just kind of get to know them on a deeper level. Um, one of the Form 3 students that I was speaking to um, confided in me as I was leaving the classroom. He was helping me bring the books back to the teacher's lounge with me. And he said, Madame, um, you know, since my mother died a few years ago, I don't get a lot of joy in the classroom. And the one thing that brings me joy is dancing. So I said, OK, Carlton, I'll see what we can do. So on Saturday night, we um, arranged a social for the students of Alleghegio Secondary School. And Sister Loretta and I, who was the nun that I was staying with um, on the uh, Dominican compound, we put together a social night for these students. And I ended up teaching the hokey pokey and the chicken dance to a bunch of high school students. Um, I think if I had done that here in the States, they would have laughed and walked out on me. But they thoroughly enjoyed it in the Solomon Islands. Um, and there's a few pictures coming up about that. Um, so while I was in the Solomons, a lot of simple joys came out, smiling, dancing, um, just being together as a community, eating with each other, preparing meals. There was much less of a distraction with technology, with the internet, with phone um, that we have here in the States. So I really appreciated that simple way of life, that quiet way of life, and that time of reflection. Um, again, and the simple joys of nature. So um, really got in touch with nature there. Um, there wasn't necessarily the water pressure, the bedding, the, um, the things you take for granted here back in the States. So I, um, I began to appreciate you know, what we have here. 
which was the chicken dance. Um, they celebrated through music and dance. This was uh, a little bit of pan pipe celebration at the ordination ceremony um, for deaconhood, brothers Malcolm and brothers, brother Malcolm and brother Bernard uh, becoming deacons. And feasting, staka kai kai, which is lots of food, was always available to, um, to feast on for any type of celebration. Uh, this was young Elizabeth, who uh, followed me around during my time at Banyu Lama. Um, and these were the pickaninnies, which is the uh, pigeon term for children. Um, and it's really interesting. You can see the blonde girls in the back. They call them blondies. It's something that's special to the Solomon Islands with the dark skin and the blonde hair. Um, and Bishop Chris, Sister Regina, Sister Maria, and Sister Loretta. Um, Fanulama was the Dominican compound that I stayed at. And it means place of peace. And it's definitely something that I found while I was there. Um, like I said, I arrived in the Solomon Islands, and I was intimidated. And for that first week, I felt unsure of what I was supposed to be doing. Um, I felt out of place. I felt a little isolated where I couldn't have a normal conversation with someone without them you know, asking to correct their English. And I found that place of peace um, with my faith. Um, although I was thousands of miles away from home, some things like the church and mass don't change. And that was something where at 5 in the morning when we woke up to have daily office and then had mass at 610, uh, much like the Kasumu crowd. And uh, although Bishop Chris would do his homilies in pigeon, and I'd have to listen extremely carefully in order to pick up uh, some of the messages that he was, um, that he was saying, that sense of peace and that sense of community, I think, still came through, um, even being thousands of miles away, having that Dominican family that I was staying with, um, and being able to fall back on my faith when I was in a new and um, unusual environment. And this was the small outdoor chapel, which was beautiful, and I wish we could adopt that here in Rhode Island without the rainy weather. Um, again, the simple joys of just picking up a beach ball and having an, a game of of volleyball. And this is young Cleoban, and Cleoban and Waisu were my two little buddies while I was uh, at the compound. I taught them how to do five little monkeys and the wheels on the bus. So uh, they didn't know much English, but I think that'll stay with them for a little while. And a um, little story, I was sitting and having, we were um, praying the rosary, and I look over, and Waisu, um, since the beginning, when I arrived, he would inch closer and closer to me each day. And by the end, he was sitting next to me and would just kind of stare at me while I was, while I was praying. But um, halfway through, after I had taught him the wheels on the bus, or the five little monkeys, excuse me, uh, he would sit next to me, and he'd whisper while we were praying, five little monkeys jumping on the bed. So it was, it was uh, I felt like at that point that I had been accepted um, into their community. And um, just the smile and the joy that we were able to bring one another. And these are some more of the kids, but this is our day at the beach. Um, and this is some of the traditional dance. Uh, this was on Mali today when they were celebrating um, their um, holiday of being a, um, a territory, or sorry, a province. Um, this was my boat expedition. And something that I took away from this um, trip was a feeling of self-confidence, um, arriving in a totally un unique culture um, without any sort of um, support outside of Bishop Chris when he was available, um, and just being able to reflect on my own strengths and knowing that I could, in fact, teach English um, to a completely new crowd, and also the fact that um, it was important to reflect because you can't just jump into a culture without uh, learning about it and um, talking with the members of those communities. And um, as a public service major, it's, it is about action, but also about reflection. So I think both of those ideas came through in this, in this trip. Um, so as a final word, I thank everyone that was uh, responsible for the donations that would make this possible. And I can't wait to hear about the stories of future Smith Fellows that are able to experience something like this as well. Did you learn any? I did. Say something.
um, as I would go off to the secondary school, uh, Charisma would say, you go low where, Madame Annie, and that is, where are you going? And at the end of the day, uh, at the end of class, I would end with, look at me behind, which is, see you later. So, look at me behind. <laughs> thank you very much to all of our uh, student uh, travelers and fellows, and thanks again to all of you who made this possible. Um, just for future reference, you should know that the blogs of each of our fellows are available on the Mission and Ministry website if you'd like to read through their experiences over the course of the summer as they actually had them. And each of the talks of the fellows, both those you heard today and the ones that were given previously this week, will also be available as archive video on the Mission and Ministry website, presumably beginning next week. And of course, if any of you would like to make this possible for another group of students, I'd be happy to talk to you. Or you can email me at jguido at providence.edu or call me. Um, the more the merrier when it comes to this, because as you see, each of the students who goes also influences dozens of other people who are not able to go. And the faith of the church, which is universal, becomes intimate as well because of their experience. So thank you very much and hope to see you at Mass.